Hello, and welcome to this edition of Math Teacher To Go. I'm Pat Doobie, and today we will be doing our introduction to formal logic. So we will discuss what is a statement, what is a truth value, how to negate a statement, and how to make compound statements from simple statements by using connectives. At the end of the lesson, you should memorize the symbols for the connectives, the negation, the and, the or, the if, then, and the if and only if, and understand how to identify a statement and how to combine them. So first of all, what is a statement? Well, every statement must be a sentence. But every sentence is not necessarily a statement. In order to be a statement, the sentence must be able to be given a value of either true or false. Labeling a statement true or false is called assigning a truth value to the statement. I'm going to do that first, sorry. So, I showed you the answers already. Pretend you didn't see that. Is this a statement or not? The car is blue. Well, there should be a period there. Somebody pointed that out to me earlier, and that would make it a full sentence. I'm not going to trick you by not putting proper punctuation and saying, no, it's not a statement, it's not a sentence. I mean, when you hear the statements, the words spoken, does it make a complete thought? The car is blue. It is 3 o'clock. Will you drive me to the store? Apples are not sweet. Winter is not cold. Is the cat running away? Some people. So look at each of these and decide whether or not it's a statement. Does it meet the criteria? Is it a complete sentence that can be assigned a value of true or false? You can stop the video and think about what your answer is for each of those as to whether it's a statement. And when you come back, the next slide will show us the answers. OK, the car is blue is a statement. If you're looking at a car, you can determine whether or not that statement's true or false. It is 3 o'clock. Right now, where I am now, it's 9.15. So that statement is false. It is a statement. Will you drive me to the store? This is a question. A question is never a statement. So the answer to that is no, it's not a statement. Even though you say, oh, it is true that I will drive you to the store, that's not really a truth value. You have to explain it more. You can't just say true and have it make any sense. Apples are not sweet. This is a statement. You may disagree on its truth value with somebody else, and depending on what kind of apple you're eating, it may or may not be sweet, but it can be assigned a truth value. Winter is not cold. That can be assigned a truth value. As I look up my window now, it's snowing and it's 20 degrees, so I would say it is not true. I would say it's false that winter is not cold. Is the cat running away? It's a question, so it's not a statement. We get, don't get true and false confused with yes and no. This, the, this says no because it's not a statement. That's the answer to the question. Is it a statement or not? And some people, that's just a phrase. That's not a full sentence, so it can't be a statement. So for convenience, when we're working with joining statements together and, and evaluating the validity of a, a series of statements connected together to form an argument, it's convenient if we just give our statements a name that's just simply a letter. We typically use P, Q, R, and S. Um, I'm not sure why if you named your statement A, B, or Z, it wouldn't be wrong. But th there are conventions in mathematics for what letters get used in general for what things. For instance, I, J, K generally represents an integer value. But within the context of this course, that's not going to be significant to you. So, so you'll see a lot of P's, Q's, and R's in this. Um, so here's an example. P, the floor is made of wood. R, the refrigerator is shiny. So whenever you see P, it means the floor is made of wood. Whenever you see R in this example, it means the refrigerator is shiny. S sitting here in my kitchen as I make this video, I can see that P has a value of false. My kitchen floor is made of vinyl. And R has a value of true. My refrigerator is kind of shiny. Sorry, there we go. So how do we, let me make sure I didn't skip anything. OK, so how do we operate on statements? Here are the symbols you must know. 
There are words that go with each of them. A negation has this symbol. It's, I believe, what we call a tilde, a squiggly, squiggly line. And it means not. When you see that, you read not. So tilde P means not P. A conjunction is symbolized by an upside-down V, and it is read and. Whenever you see this symbol, you're going to say and. A disjunction, didn't mean to do that, sorry. A disjunction is symbolized by a right side up V and is read or. Now, part of your trick is going to be to learn this, is going to be to quickly learn the difference between these two symbols. Which one means and and which one means or? Well, here's a way to remember it. If you put a line through this one, you get an A. That one means and. That means the other one, the V, means or. A conditional symbol is a one-directional arrow, and it's read if-then. So if I do this, it's read if P, then Q. A biconditional symbol... Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here that you may or may not be seeing. A biconditional symbol is a double arrow, and it's read if and only if. So if I see this, it's P if and only if Q. That means the only way P is true is if Q is true. The only way Q is true is if P is true. Their truth values always match um, in order to make that a true statement. So, quantifiers. So when we negate a statement, it's sometimes very straightforward. If we want to negate the statement, it is snowing, we simply insert the word not. Well, the simple statement doesn't have any what we call quantifiers. Quantifiers are words like all, none, no, or some. That, they give you a quantity. It's not true for, you know, it's, it's not just a single thing you're talking about. You're talking about a group of things. So you have to be careful when we negate those. You can't just simply throw a not in, and I'll give you an example in a moment. All right, I'm just going to do this. So when we negate a statement, we're going to change it to its opposite meaning. I just used the example of it is snowing. Right now, as I look out my window, that's true. It is not snowing. As I look out my window, that would be false. If, if you have written the negation of a statement, the statement and its negation must have opposite truth values. One must be false and one must be true, and they can never both have the same truth value. If they can both have the same truth value, you haven't written the negation. So, when I negate a statement that has the words all are, I, have, I can't just say all are not, I have to say some are not. And why is that? Well, if I do this, let me make some X's here. If I say all the X's are red, you're going to tell me that that is false because not all of the X's are red, okay? But if I say, if you negate that by saying, and just, it, so if I say all the X's are red, all X's are red. If you negate that simply by putting in the word not there, all X's are not red. That's not true because there are some X's that are red, and that's also a little ambiguous. What you're trying to say is there are some X's that are not red, so that's what you say. The way to negate all X's are red is to say some X's, so you replace the word all with some, and then you stick the word not in, and you would have red there. Sorry for the messy handwriting. But you get the idea. So we have a series of these, 
So these are quantifiers, all, none, some, some are not. And for each quantifier here, you are shown how to write its opposite or its negation. So if I say none of the students are wearing glasses, you negate it by saying some of the students are wearing glasses. If I say some of the students are late for class, you say none of the students are late for class to mean the opposite. If you say some are not, some students are not late for class, you say all students are late for class. So if I say some are not late for class, that means some people were there on time. You say, no, 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 all the students are late for class means nobody was there on time. So if you're saying for some are, you're allowing for some are not, so they're not negations. So if I do the, the example with the X's again, and I'll write less of them just to keep it quick, and I say some X's are red, and you say some X's are not red, both of those can be true at the same time. It is true that some X's are red. Here they are. It is also true that some X's are, X's are not red. Here it is. They're both true at the same time, so they cannot be negations of each other. So here is a visual way to remember that. If you have all R in your statement, you negate it by saying some are not. If you have some are not in your statement, you negate it by saying all are. If you have some are, the opposite of that is to say none are. And if you start with none are, the opposite is to say some are. So that is a visual for you to remember. Have that out when you do your homework because there'll be some questions about how to negate statements and this will be handy because these are the tricky ones, the quantified statements. There we go. Sorry, I'm, ha I'm having some technical difficulties here. There we go. Connecting statements. So this isn't very interesting until we, until we start to connect some statements together. We use those connective symbols I showed you, and they'll come up again in a later slide here. Negation isn't really a connective, but you need to know the symbol because it's used everywhere. But a negation can be just on one statement. Connectives always connect two statements. In only two statements, you put an and between two statements to make a compound statement. Now, we will also join that with other connectives to other statements. You can join more than two statements, but you're always just looking at what two statements are joined together to determine its truth value. So you have and, or, and this should say if, then, and the other one should be if, and, only if. Okay, so you saw the symbols for those earlier. They come up again later. When we use the word or in this class, we mean both things can be true and the or statement is still true. So if I say I will wash the car or I will fill the tank with gas and I do both of them, my statement was still true. There's another form of or you may have seen in programming applications and other places and actually more intuitively we think called the exclusive or. That means if both, thing ha both things happen, it doesn't mean or. We think of or in English as you must choose one or the other. But here, one or the other or both. So both is okay for an or statement. If both things are true, the or statement. Are if both statements on either side of the or are true, the compound statement taken together as one is also true. So if I fill the car with gas and I clean the car, I do both of those things, the fact that I said I would fill the car with gas or clean the car does not mean I didn't tell the truth. So we use the inclusive or here. A simple statement is just one idea. I will fill the car with gas. That's one idea. Compound statement, another simple statement would be I will clean the car. When I join them together is when I get a compound statement. So two or more simple statements. And we will join more than two, but in the process of determining the truth value of a compound statement, you're really only looking at two statements at a time, the ones on either side of the connective. 
So two more statements of compound. They are joined by connectives. The connectives are, once again, and, or, and that, that would be true if, if both statements were true because we're using the inclusive or, if then, and if and only if. So we've talked a little bit about negation, not statements. We use this symbol, I think it's called a tilde, to indicate the word not. So if I have statement P and I want to say the opposite of it, I say not P. Here is the symbol for conjunction. It's an upside down V. If I put a line through it, it looks like an A and that's read AND. So the thing you want to key in on on this slide is words like but, however, and nevertheless also mean AND. So when you see it is snowing, but it is not cold. That means, and it is not cold. So that's key, or it is snowing, however it is not cold. You would use up an and statement if you were to symbolize what you were saying. You would use the and symbol. So writing conjunctions, we take statements and turn them into letters. We assign them letters, and then we join them together using connectives. So here our two statements are going to be about Green Day, the band, being on tour, or Green Day recording a new CD. And be, watch how we turn these into statements. We actually, when we turn something into a statement, we typically turn, label the statement in the positive. We skip the not. And then if I call this statement P and I want to use the not on tour, I use the negation of P. So T is going to be Green Day is on tour and R is going to be Green Day is recording a new CD. But in the slide before, we learned that Green Day was not on tour, so we say not T and R. That's the symbol for and. So the and is called a conjunction. The or is called a disjunction because you consider each separately, and if either is true, or both is true in our case, they will be true. The the conjunction, you have to consider the two statements together. The only way two statements joined with an and are true is if both statements were true themselves. So or is inclusive, and the disjunction of P and Q, here's your symbol for it. The disjunction of P, Q, P, or Q, there's your symbol for or. So how do we write a disjunction? Well, let's talk about Maria in her leisure time. Maria will go to the circus is statement P. Statement Q is Maria will go to the zoo. Write this in symbolic form. Well, P represents Maria will go to the circus, and Q represents Maria will go to the zoo. So there's P, there's Q, and I've got the OR in between. So you get the OR gives you this symbol here. So what if we want to say Maria will go to the circus, well, excuse me, Maria will go to the zoo, or Maria will not go to the circus? We have to be careful because we've changed the order on you here. Maria going to the zoo was Q, and it might be helpful to actually do this when you do your homework. Write out the statement and then label them, and Maria will not go to the circus. That's not P, and the symbol in between them will be an or, so I have Q or not P. So sometimes it's confusing in English. We put a lot of things together. If we separate them with commas, it will help us to see how to write these symbolically. A comma groups simple statements together. In writing the compound statement symbolically, the simple statements on the same side of the comma are grouped together within parentheses. That tells us to do this first in mathematics. So the comma is what we use to figure out where to put parentheses. So if I read this, dinner includes soup and salad or vegetable of the day. There are several ways you could interpret that, but what I see here is that soup and salad is on one side of the comma, then I have an or, then I have vegetable of the day. So here's my soup and salad in parentheses, and here's my vegetable of the day. And the and comes from this and here. 
So here's another example of changing symbols into words. The house is for sale is P, and Q is we can afford to buy the house. If I'm given this word into sim in symbols, if I'm given that in symbols and I'm told this is what the statements mean up here, I can write that in English. P is the house is for sale, not Q is we cannot afford to buy the house. This is an example without a quantifier, so you can just insert the word not and negate it. So that is how you would translate those symbols into words. So turn it around a little bit. The house, we're talking about not P or not Q now. So that becomes the house is not for sale is not P. We cannot afford to buy the house is not Q. And there's your or. Just do it a step at a time. It's pretty straightforward. Here is the tricky one. This is tricky because we have a negation outside of parentheses. Whenever you have that negation outside of parentheses, you write the word, it is false. Don't write not, write it is false. And then you write the rest of what you want, which is here. It is false that the house is for sale and we can afford to buy the house. If I just translated the inside, it would say the house is for sale and we can afford to buy the house. Put the negation outside. It makes a difference. Don't do it your own way. Do it my way or else. I'm sorry, I get a little harsh there, but what I'm trying to tell you is this is a common mistake students make. Students will say the house is not for sale and we can afford to buy the house, and that's not the same meaning. We'll see later when we do truth tables. We'll take this apart and I will show you why it does not mean the same thing as not P and Q. If you say the house is not for sale and we can afford to buy the house, and it's not even the same as not P and not Q. Turns out it's the same as not P or not Q, but we'll get into that later. But when you're translating these for now, this symbol outside of parentheses becomes it is false that. So this is the key to this slide, knowing that this symbol outside of parentheses means it is false, that, and then you just translate what's inside the parentheses. All right. The if-then statement gets dealt more in the third section of this unit. For now, we're going to mostly look at and, and and or immediately until we, um, until we get familiar with truth tables and some other processes. But the conditional, we call the if-then a conditional goes in one direction. It only works in one direction. You can't switch the sides and have it mean the same thing. The antecedent is the part before the arrow. The consequent is the part after the arrow. So P is the antecedent. Statement Q is the consequent. If P happens, then Q happens is what it means. It means if P is true, Q is guaranteed to be true. So if I want to write a conditional statement, the portrait is a pastel, is P. And Q is the portrait is by Beth Anderson. If I want to write the portrait is a pastel, then it is by Beth Anderson. Here is the antecedent. That goes, that's P, that's Q, here's your arrow. The if-then together really makes the arrow, but putting the arrow at the then makes sense. Sometimes we leave the word then out, though, um, in English, so we be careful. To, you can assume it's there. Um, but in this case, leaving it out wouldn't make any sense anyway. All right, sorry, I'm having trouble turning off my pen before I change slides. There we go. So if I want to say, if the portrait is by Beth Anderson, then the portrait is not a pastel, I look and see what my statements are, and I see that the portrait by Beth Anderson, this is stated just as it is, is Q, then the portrait is not a pastel, that'll be not P, and I see my if thin, and that tells me I need an arrow between them, but the Q comes first, Right after the if, before the then, so it is the antecedent. It goes on the left of the arrow. The not P goes on the right. And the order makes a difference for this one. This is the only one that order makes a difference for, um, as far as the value of the truth table. It, you know, saying P and Q has the same truth values as saying Q and P. But here, if you change the order of the if then, you mean something different. So here's one that uses that it is false that. It is false that means you're going to follow with parentheses. 
if the portrait is by Beth Anderson, so that's Q, then the portrait is a pastel, that's P. So this inside the parentheses is a simple if-then statement, but I have to put the negation outside parentheses in order to write this statement symbolically. If and only if is called a biconditional, and if you think of the conditional, it's an arrow in one direction, the biconditional is in two directions. So it's read if and only if. In math, we often abbreviate that with two Fs. IFF -F means if and only if. So this statement, P, double-sided arrow Q, is read P if and only if Q. So P is Alex plays goalie on the lacrosse team. Q is the Titans win the Champions Cup. If I want to write P, double arrow Q in words, it means... If Alex plays on the lacrosse team if and only if the Titans win the cup. So this was P was Alex and Q was the Titans win the cup, and you just put the if and only if in the middle. Okay, so if we change the order or change use a negation, this one would be the Titans. Oh, I went back a slide, sorry. I went forward a slide. Having technical difficulties here. So the Titans win the Champions Cup if and only if Alex does not play goalie on the lacrosse team. I mean, I don't know, maybe Alex, maybe Alex plays for the other team and he's good. Or maybe it means he's the Titans goalie and he's bad. I don't know. But this is an example, another example of if and only if. And here is one again with the it is false that. This is probably the most missed. This is the most missed part of this section. If you see it is false, that if you see a negation outside parentheses, you write it is false, that, and then you translate the inside of the parentheses alone. So you can read that for yourself there. If it is false, that if Alex plays goalie on the lacrosse team, if and only if the Titans do not win the Champions Cup. Here is a summary. This is handy. This is what you must memorize. The formal names are handy and will be used, so you should know those. It's far more important, though, that you memorize the symbol and how it's read and how it's used. Okay, so you can go off and do the homework on this section now, and we will resume this next time I see you or next time I send you a video. That's all for Math Teacher to Go. Goodbye.